Since 1996, the United States Department of Defense has accumulated an $8.5 trillion black hole in its budget. The number is so staggering that it is quite literally inconceivable. Several times larger than the annual budget of the entire federal government, it is equivalent to half of the entire fraudulent debt of the United States government itself. Aside from a recent report by Reuters or the occasional back-of-the-paper mention in one of the dinosaur media outlets, however, you'd have to turn to Russian state-sponsored media to discover this fact. Since 1996, the Pentagon has spent $8.5 trillion in taxpayer money that has never been accounted for. And nobody can say for sure how many billions of that amount were wasted on goods and services that were never delivered, on overpayments to contractors and many other things. What does Congress do about it? Nothing. And national security expert Steve Miles is here with me to help us crunch the, these numbers. Eight and a half trillion dollars unaccounted for? It's a lot of money. Um, this is the kind of thing that you would think would bring Capitol Hill to a screeching halt. There'd be hearings kind of almost daily. You'd have various committees looking into it. None of that. An alien visiting from another planet could be forgiven for legitimately questioning why this scandal is virtually unknown while the details of Justin Bieber's latest arrest or Miley Cyrus's latest antics are literally unavoidable in the cultural zeitgeist, or why the use of steroids in Major League Baseball is considered worthy of earnest congressional investigation, while this unaccounted-for $8.5 trillion is relegated to passing mention in the occasional congressional hearing. Fiscal year 1999, $2.3 trillion missing. Fiscal year 2000, 1.1 trillion missing. And DOD is the number one reason why the government can't balance its checkbook. The Pentagon has claimed year after year that the reason it can't account for the money is because its computers don't communicate with each other. My second question, Mr. Secretary, is who has the contracts today to make those systems communicate with each other? How long have they had those contracts? And how much have the taxpayers paid for them? The second question, uh, I've forgotten what the second question was. What seems perplexing from an outside perspective, however, is mundane reality to those inside the system. The truth is that despite all the fuzzy rhetoric about republics and inalienable rights and the rule of law, the United States is nothing but an oligarchy, run by a handful of international banking syndicates, their multinational corporate cronies, and the politicians in their back pocket. The Pentagon budget story is not reported on for the simple reason that it is the defense contractors that own much of the media and have intimate relations with those outlets that are not directly under their control. In April of 2008, David Barstow of the New York Times broke a story about how the Pentagon used 75 military analysts, former military men, to get the Bush administration's version of the war in Iraq out to the American people. We've got generals, and if you ask them about the prospects for war with Iraq, they think it is almost certain. And the defense contractors, in turn, own the political figures that decide who receive the government's defense contracts. The classic example of this is Dick Cheney. As George H.W. Bush's Secretary of Defense, he awarded a contract to KBR, a Halliburton subsidiary, to investigate the possibility of contracting out military services to private companies. Unsurprisingly, KBR concluded this would be a good thing, and soon Halliburton and other private companies were receiving a larger and larger slice of the Washington defense budget pie. Also unsurprisingly, Cheney left his post as defense secretary at the end of the Bush administration and became CEO of Halliburton. But this is not the only example of the defense contractor revolving door. As Ryan Dawson of the ANC Report notes in his new book, The Separation of Business and State, Thomas White, the secretary of the Army, was involved with Enron as a senior executive. He unloaded 200,000 shares, $12 million worth, of their stock during that scandal. While White was serving as vice chairman of Enron Energy Services, he actively used his political contacts to give Enron a single bidder contract to privatize the power supply for Fort Hamilton. He was also fond of using military jets for personal trips for himself and his wife. And, 
Gordon England, the Secretary of the Navy, flipped back and forth between General Dynamics and Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin is at the top of the list when it comes to Pentagon contracts, and General Dynamics is usually in the top five. England was the president of General Dynamics Land Systems Division, and later became president for General Dynamics' entire Fort Worth division. That division was sold to Lockheed, and he became a president there. Sadly, the list of such blatant conflicts of interests is nearly endless, and by no means limited to the military-industrial complex. The same is true of the revolving door in the biotech industry around companies like Monsanto. This list of officials includes Linda Fisher, a senior EPA official who later became Monsanto's VP of Government and Public Affairs, Michael Taylor, Obama's deputy FDA commissioner who also served as Monsanto's VP for Public Policy, and U.S. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who served as a corporate lawyer for Monsanto in the 1970s. And in the healthcare sector, where high-ranking insurance company executives literally write the legislation that mandates everyone to purchase health insurance from the corporations. Liz Fowler is ch our, my chief health counsel. Liz Fowler has put my team together, the health, health care team. Liz Fowler worked for me many years ago, since left the private sector, and then came back when she realized that, that she could be there in the creation of health care reform, because she wanted to, in a certain sense, that's be her, her professional lifetime goal. She put together that, uh, the white paper last November 2008, 87-page um, document, which became the basis, the foundation, the blueprint from which almost all health care measures and all bills both sides of the aisle came from. The problem is so blatant, so obvious, so out in the open, that even its opponents readily admit to its existence. And yet it continues without significant opposition from the public. How can this happen? Because, in a twist that again would be difficult to explain to anyone not steeped in this system, People disagree not on the problem itself, but on what to call it. And you have people on the, the so-called left saying, well, it's all the corporatocracy, and they're right. And then you have people on the so-called right saying it's all big government, and they're right, without realizing they're talking about the same thing, really, at the end of the day. Yeah, there's actually, there's sort of two methods that they do there. They'll say, well, the corporations are, it's all the corporations because they're bribing the government to, to act a certain way. And... You can say, well, actually, it's the state, because they're the ones with all the power, that's enabling the corporations you know, by the, awarding them your tax money and everything. And it's the same result. And what it really is, it's, it's the state and corporations together walking on top of you. It's, it's not that one has to bribe the other to act that way. It's in their own interest to do that. Once people realize they could vote themselves money, it was over. And that's what they do. And we, we've had a massive abuse of no-bid contracts, for example, which were supposed to be for emergencies, but it's just a way to wipe out the bidding process and literally allow the government to award money to itself. Because when you talk about a corporation, look at its board members, because corporations are not just, only, they're not companies, they're publicly traded. They don't just have a boss that gets oversimplified. But if you look at their BOD, they have overlapping membership with people in the Pentagon and people in the president's cabinet and the treasury or, or you know, name a department. Uh, and it's total insider trading. Not, they're not only just investing in the people they're giving money in, they work for them simultaneously in the unelected portions of government, like the Pentagon is probably the largest one. Uh, and then follow, you, know, you have commerce, labor, et cetera. And they, they all do it. They all do it. So it, what we really need is separation of corporation and snakes and not just blame the government or blame the corporations. You have to see how they're working together and, and not get so fixated in belonging to a group or something on your left or right or whatever. That's really irrelevant. This is the ultimate example of divide and conquer in action a small, readily identifiable ruling oligarchy that no serious political observer denies the existence of is able to keep the public from attacking it by dividing them along ideological grounds so that the public spends all their time arguing over definitions and splitting doctrinal hairs instead of attacking the commonly acknowledged enemy. You couldn't ask for a more perfect system of control. Thankfully, the corollary of this divide-and-conquer strategy is that it is possible to unite the people against their common enemy simply by employing some rhetorical strategies of our own. 
All right, well, we could go on and on and talk about all of these problems. We could even talk about the solutions, which, again, are not particularly controversial. There are a lot of people on both sides of the spectrum, again, that would um, that would agree with the idea that um, there is something beyond just taxing the rich or just cutting social welfare. How about we cut the corporate welfare? Everyone can yeah. agree, agree to that, except for the corporate fat cats themselves. But uh, the real question, the $20 trillion question, is how do we move the conversation to that point, given even the types of mental barriers that have been erected around these real solutions. Yeah, I think you have to approach it, one, without a label, like don't come in saying I'm an anarchist or libertarian or whatever. Just come in saying we need to cut corporate welfare. And everyone will assume you're one of them, you know, because everyone agrees with that. Everybody agrees with that. Um, cutting foreign aid, I think most people agree with or reducing it. Um you know, not ha the not saying we shouldn't have no bid contracts. You sort of lose people because they don't know what that means. But keeping it simple, and I think that one corporate welfare for sure for banks, as well as for military industries. But you don't have to necessarily spell it out. Just say corporate welfare, and they'll they'll understand. Yeah, we we don't need to be bailing out all these people with billions of dollars. That's kind of what got Occupy originally going was the bailouts of the banks and the Tea Party taxed enough already well they, they don't want the same thing and and I think most people could agree on that they just get caught up in these wedge issues and these sort of um, socially fun things to argue about that aren't really even legislative issues and they get they get watered down by that and so we have to really keep it simple because not everybody's political uh, and we have a lot of low information voters too, but you have to just keep coming back to it and say we have to cut corporate welfare, and these are the people that vote for it, and you have to make that a, a one issue pony to say maybe no more wars is a good. That's a nice way to save money. We don't need to have all these wars and occupations everywhere, and we need to cut corporate welfare. And then there's a whole CDE, but don't worry about that. Like that's the two. If we could do that, I mean, getting rid of the Fed's a big thing, but I don't think we can get to that point and still we start reducing their grip first on the Congress that the lobbies have. Uh, and I think that starts by people getting really upset about corporate bailouts and welfare. They have to pay all that money back and we have to stop bombing people. So peace and ending that kind of welfare. And we have plenty of money left over for whatever social programs that are struggling we, we'd have plenty of money already for that. And there are other market solutions that are better than, than social welfare too. But I don't think you can really get that. You just can't bring up too many issues. And so I think we have to start with uh, ending war and then sec and I think also ending corporate welfare. I think two is enough and that would be a good place. And there's easy solutions for that. As we shall see next week, the idea of uniting the people against the oligarchs is not only possible, it is actually happening in case after case. But as always, it is a question of whether it is enough to push back against this oligarchical control, or if it is too little, too late. Not, uh, uh, not continuing Congresswoman Section Harman, 215 let me, let me and interrupt getting the... You. Congresswoman, let me interrupt you just for a moment. We've got some breaking news out of Miami. Stand by if you will. Right now in Miami, Justin Bieber has been arrested on a number of charges. The judge is reading the charges. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.